right, the reason why I wanted to do this was Graham Hancock was on Joe Rogan, and, you know, he invited Flint Dibble. And it was his choice to invite him, and that was the thing that they did. Um, and it took two years for that uh, podcast to come out. But in the meantime, you know, there was some mudslinging that occurred. And by the time they actually had the debate, it was more about the mudslinging than the content. And one of the things that uh, happened in that debate was you had a, a real time uh, professional, um, you know, academic uh, person, you know, sort of debunking Graham's statements in real time. And now I don't think Graham actually actually performed very well, but but I think it was because he was too caught off guard about all the mudslinging that had occurred before having that debate. And, you know, I made a couple response videos to uh, some of the things that Flint had said. Um, and, you know, if there's anything I'll say about Graham, he's one of the more, if you're talking about the alternative history uh, sphere, as I call it, he's one of the more factual guys that there is. I mean, he does real research. I don't agree with everything he says. There's quite a few things I don't agree with. I don't agree with like Bimini Road is is uh, man-made. I think it's natural. I don't think um, Yogoni is uh, man-made. I think it's natural. But there are things I do agree with him about. And um, needless to say, you know, he sort of took it on the chin uh, with Flint there, um, sort of real-time debunking a lot of the things that he had to say. Um, and I did a couple of responsibility, so did uh, Dan the Dunker, and a lot of things Flint said weren't actually on par with the truth. I'll say that to be polite, and I think we pointed that out. And then you hear you have uh, Billy Carson coming on, um, Joe Rogan, and there's nobody there in real time to debunk the things that he's saying. And he's sort of just going off the cuff and saying lots of statements. And when I started to dig into the things that he was saying, um, man, I couldn't get past like 15 minutes like we talked about without finding a lot of things to counter as far as what he was talking about. Um, now, I'll say I don't follow a lot of these current alternative um speakers i don't follow like uncharted x i don't follow like billy i don't follow these guys i'm old school i go back to uh john anthony west graham hancock you know robert shock um you know all these guys back in the day so this is my background and when i realized that there was a market for ideas on this type of stuff i decided i would you know put my voice forward and start speaking on all about it because a lot of things I was hearing were either just people ripping off people that I respected and just repeating their words or, you know, to be frank, a lot of nonsense. So I want to get down to the truth about ancient history and the past. I don't want to speculate. You know, when I first got into it, making videos, you know, I was a little less serious about what I was talking about and I would make sort of my own opinion, so to speak, about things that I saw. Um, but I'll give credit to uh, Dan and Dunker for basically making me get more serious about my research. And now when I do my research, I actually review uh, peer reviewed papers, journals, I dig down to the truth. I find old books, you know, from the 18th century and things like that. And what I learned is that there's a lot of knowledge that is sort of stowed away and tucked away that people don't have access to, um, which allows, you know, for some grandiose ideas or concepts to be put out there. And I think it's important if you want to be uh, an alternative researcher to not be, you know, outside the boundaries of reality, so to speak. And there are answers for this stuff. And sometimes the answers are a lot cooler than 
the speculation. And that's the part about it that I like. You know, I like finding stuff that's, you know, really interesting, even though it's not like speculative or, you know, along around the lines of ancient aliens type tier stuff. So that's why I thought it would be a good idea to, uh, you know, respond to uh, what Billy had to say on JRE for the sake of um, alternative ancient history and for the sake of, you know, sort of standing up for uh, Graham, who's a person that I really respect. Because if there was a real, uh, if you want to call a Syrianologist or a person who knew cuneiform or a person like yourself who knows this stuff in and out, um, on that podcast, it would have went a lot different. So I think that um, what what I want to try to do is be that sort of person between you and me and review uh, the things that were said on, on that episode. Appreciate that you want to do this with me because this, it is important to, you know, show the other side of what your research has uh, presented because once somebody makes absolute about something, that means that your research no longer matters and you should just follow what they say. And we're not here for that. We're here to actually understand what has been shared or at least the closest to it. Right. Right. Absolutely. 100%. So uh, do you want to queue up that first clip? There's a whole website called Sitchin is wrong.com. <laughs> like people go crazy about him. Yeah. But what, when he starts talking about it, you, you, when you read some of the things that they wrote and when you see like some of the, the images that they created, the images that look like the double helix from DNA and, there's a bunch of the like that now we represent the the caduceus, mm -hmm. which is represents pharmacies and drugs. Like the th that's the old version yeah. of an image of the double helix of DNA, or at least it looks yeah. super similar to that. Oh, it definitely is because it's referenced even in, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead and other ancient texts. Uh, when he's talking about the caduceus and the Sumerian version, uh, he throws it to Billy and he says, "There's a version of that in the Book of the Dead." Um. You know, the caduceus or caduceus, however you want to pronounce it, uh, actually was two ribbons at first. Progressed in ancient uh, Greece, um, the ribbons became associated with snakes and um, uh, they became intertwined with mercury. Um, and there's a fresco from Pompeii called the punishment of Ixon. Uh, with Mercury holding the caduceus. Uh, let me see if I, I can uh, share my screen here and we can take a look at that image. There we go. Mm -hmm. So see, this is uh, a fresco in Pompeii um, with Mercury holding the, the caduceus. Okay. It's not exactly uh, what you would envision, but that's, that's the truth. So I'm going to stop sharing and we'll move on. Um, uh, when he refers to the Sumerian version, you know, it's my belief that what he's actually talking about is the tree of life uh, depicted in many Assyrian reliefs. Um, many people misinterpret that as a double helix, but when you really look at it, it's not really showing that at all. And I'm going to show uh, an Assyrian relief um, with the tree of life that many people misappropriate as uh, uh, caduceus. Uh, there it is. So right here, we have the two, uh, I think, Alula or something like that, um, flanking the tree of life. You know, many people try to misappropriate this as um, a double helix. It's it's really not a double helix. Can you see that on there? Am I sharing it right? Yep, I see it. I see it. Okay. Um, so let's move on. I think that's what Joe Rogan's referring to because that's what most people are familiar with. Um uh, so let's keep going with. Um, uh, so let's keep going forward. Uh, uh, so that's a neo Assyrian um, relief from 860 BCE. Uh, it's when in the Nimrod Palace in modern day Iraq. Uh, it shows a panel of um, eagle headed winged protective spirits flanking the tree of life, uh, performing an act of worship. Uh, but however, there is a Sumerian version of the Caduceus, uh, which is called the Ningishida, if I can pronounce that properly. It's fairly rare. That's why I don't think it's what 
uh, Joe Rogan was referring to, uh, but it can be found on ancient Babylonian cylinder seals. Um, there's one that's been highlighted in a book um, that was printed in the 1800s called The Cylinders and Ancient Oriental Seals by Morgan J. Pierpont. And I will uh, share that screen and we can look at that image as well. So here we see one of the very uh, early prototype versions of the caduceus and a uh, cylinder scroll. Um, this is this is very rare. A lot of people, you know, aren't very familiar with this. So that's why I don't think Joe's actually really referring to this, but it is sort of the, you can see the snakes here, um, the intertwining um, serpentine uh, snakes um, uh, wrapped around uh, a center stem. All right, so we'll go forward. Um, uh, the best representation of the Ningashita can be seen in the libation vase of Gudea, which is uh, circa 2100 BCE. And this is where we can clearly see um, the, the helical intertwined serpents uh, around a center pole. Uh, so let me share the screen. We can look at that. So this is one of the only and best representations of what would be considered the uh, ancient Sumerian uh, caduceus. Um, and there's, there's not many others besides this one other than the, uh, the scrolls that I just previously uh, showed. So uh, moving on, the symbol is comprised of two snakes and twin a rod accompanied by two griffins represented in Nigashita, uh, the right hand scepter god. Nigashita was the herder of earth and served as a liaison between the ruler and the mother goddess Ishtar, goddess of fertility who worshipped Sumer as early as the Uruk period. Um, so uh, Billy to say there's a representation of Caduceus or Nigashita in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Uh, so let's talk about the so-called quote-unquote Book of the Dead. It isn't a solitary book in any sense. Uh, the term conjures up ideas, something of, out of the movie Evil Dead, but it's nothing like that at all, nor it is uh, a single book of the dead. Uh, even a proper translation of that term uh, was coined in the 19th century. Uh, the proper translation is spells going forth by day. Uh, and there's no single book at all. It's a series of spells and guidance for the deceased to traverse the underworld after death, and reach the other side and live for eternity. It can be found. There you go, buddy. That's the one. That is the one. That is the number one source that I re retrieved my information from. Um, it can be found written on tomb walls and papyruses. Um, they were curated by scribes for each individual, and while there is a representation of a snake, as in Spell 17, with the great pet cat Mao, killing Apophis, the great serpent, enemy of the sun god Ra with a knife, there is no version of the Caduceus in, or Nigashita in the Book of the Dead. And my source, as you just pointed out, is the Oxford Handbook of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which you just showed. So that's excellent. Uh, let me just share my screen real quick again. Uh, we can show Apophis. You know, Apophis uh, is in the Book of the Dead, but there is no intertwining snake whatsoever uh, in the Book of the Dead. Um, so let's see what we got here. It's taking a little time. There we go. We can see it. Here's um, the, the cat, which represents Ra uh, severing Apophis, uh, who's around the Tree of Life. So there, I mean, there's similarities between the two, but they're not exact. Uh, and I think that's important to point out. Mm -hmm. um, so moving forward. Um, now, there is what's called the Book of the Secret Chamber, or the Imdiwat, which describes the sun god Ra's journey through the 12 divisions of the netherworld at night. There are many representations of serpents in this, 
with the most extensive surviving version being found in the walls of tomb for Tutmosis III. Uh, in the fourth hour of Indiwat, there is a realm Ra encounters a zigzag pathways represented by a multi-headed snake. Um, I can show all of these. I don't want to bog it down too much, but let's see what we can do. So as the sun god Ra, so what the Egyptians believed is that when the sun set it and went uh, beyond the horizon through the night, it traversed a bunch of trials and tribulations. And each hour was accompanied by a certain trial that the sun disk had to traverse. So here we see uh, a three-headed snake. Uh, in the seventh hour, Ra encounters Apophis, who attempts to ground his solar barge. Uh, this is all from Tutmosis III. Here is Apophis trying to ground the barge. Um, and he's unsuccessful, and he's severed into multiple pieces. Um, cutting to the chase, this is the only one that is similar. <clears throat> In the 10th hour, this panel is showing the sun god Ra, soul merging with Osiris, initiating the process of regeneration and rebirth, my friend, as the sun dies and is sunset only be to be reborn at dawn. Um, and we can see here, that this is the only representation that could be sort of assimilated with uh, the Caduceus or the Nigazaga, um, but it has an entirely different meaning. Um, and although it's similar, I, I wouldn't say it's exactly the same at all. Um, it's interesting enough to say that, you know, different cultures had similar motifs but I think it's reckless to try and say they're identical or the same. So um, to say that it's legitimately the same thing had different meanings and they had different reasons for each culture and each representation. So, you know, while he's not totally off base, um, I think the, the facts are more interesting than making a generalization. I think right, right. what's what I'm getting at. And, and you're saying that he's just the source that he's using is incorrect, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know where he gets it. I have, um, I have many representations of the book of the dead mm -hmm. and there is no, um, helical snake uh, representation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that there is no, no quote unquote, singular book of the dead right yeah right the, exactly the book of the dead is a, a collection of tomb reliefs and papyruses that were uh, basically purchased for each individual in order for them to traverse the underworld and make it to the afterlife it's fascinating it's interesting um, but there's no reason to put false attributions uh upon these things like they're 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 interesting enough on their own right right uh without making inappropriate um correlations you know right. and i think that does a disservice to anybody doing this research and, and i agree with you and i say that because it seems like he picks a version of the book of the dead for his narrative it doesn't fit the whole general idea of what the book of the dead is because the book of the dead, like you said, was generally for the individual. Everybody right. had their own journey to the afterlife. Right. Um, there may be some similarities, of course. Right. Right. Like the weighing to, of the heart was essential. Yeah, exactly. But the point is, is that there are going to be uh, uh, similarities, especially when there's an afterlife. I mean, we, we journey through life as as from from a baby to an adult to to an elder person and why wouldn't we have a journey on the afterlife if they believe that there is an afterlife right especially right. when they talk about it so much in saying that each book of the dead is for that individual person you know their their journey is going to be differently their outcome is going to be different and that's what i seen too because when i hear people say the book of the dead says that i say well which version you right. Know, that's, that's the one that thing that I what was, addition. Yeah, exactly. And then they say, what you mean? There's only one. I said, no, there's many. Matter of fact, 
the one you may be reading might be for one dead person. The one that I might be reading for might be for another one. Yeah. And from my research, what I learned is that it became a commodity near the end of the Egyptian uh, dynasties. Uh, it started off as something that was only for the royals, but it became something of, um, you know, a merchant type deal where you could buy different versions. You could, you could buy a package. It was almost like a, a subscription service where you could get how many spells do you want? You want 10 spells? You want nine spells? You want 17 spells? Uh, it's going to cost you. I can give you eight spells for this much. I can give you uh, 12 spells for that much. I can give you the grand package of 17 spells for this much. And it all depended on, you know, the finances of the particular individual. So, um, you know, a lot of it is mystified and uh, deified in, in the modern times. Um, you know, like that's the reality. Like, and you know, reality to me is much more interesting than uh, misappropriation. You know, yeah. I think a lot of this stuff is much more fascinating when you get down to the truth of it than what you know, some of the alternative researchers, you know, talk about today. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. The story is fascinating, enjoyable already by itself. You can literally make a great sci-fi movie from it already. You don't have yeah. to, you know, exaggerate what's already out there. It's this stuff is already fascinating. Right. Why what, do you need to embellish? Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. All right, so let's go on to the it's second clip is that that exists, yeah. and that this was. It's so hard for people to put in their brain mm -hmm. five thousand years of time, yeah. and that there's these people that have this very bizarre language. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. when you look at that language, we don't even know what it sounds like, right? Right. No, and the the language popped up out of nowhere. <laughs> what he made it. What he might have said about the caduceus. Whatever the, it, it could be construed as me like parsing things or whatever. It wasn't in the Book of the Dead. It was in this other book. Okay, that that's fine. Um, it's a minor discrepancy, but this this is an absolutely ridiculous statement. Uh, I mean, uh, so let me just get into it. Um, uh, he said it came out of nowhere. Actually, it developed over uh, hundreds of years um, from 3,500 BCE, um, approximately, uh, what's called as pictograms or protocuniform as it uh, reached uh, 3,200 uh, BCE. Uh, the pictographic symbols morphed into phonograms, which are uh, symbolic representations of sounds. Um, and it was first noted in the city of Uruk. And eventually, uh, sillilograms, uh, which are symbols that represent syllables in or around 2,900 to 2,300 BCE, uh, the early uh, dynastic period. Uh, it became a full-fledged uh, writing system at that time. Uh, cuneiform was used by all the great civilizations that emerged from Mesopotamia, including the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Emilites, etc. Um, previous even pictographic writings were uh, tokens. Uh, this is the most fascinating thing, I, and I this is where it really gets interesting. Uh, these tokens go back uh, upwards of 8,000 BCE. Uh, the tokens were used as counters to keep track of goods. Uh, they were the earliest code system. Uh, and signs for transmitting information. Each token shape was semantic, referring to a particular unit of merchandise. For example, a cone or a sphere stood respectively for a small or large measure of grain. The facts are there, you just have to look. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We can take a look at this stuff right here. Um, so here we have the geometric shapes. Each one of these ge geometric shapes represented a certain or specific thing. Um, and at some point near 3,500 BCE, they realized they could represent these tokens as markings on clay instead of the tokens themselves. Uh, and that's when we see this. So, you know, instead of having a, uh, a conical shape and a sphere, they marked it into a piece of clay. So here we have the conical shape, here we have the sphere, and here we have the representation, and they put it into clay. All right. 
So I'm going to stop sharing for a second here and go on. Around 3,200 BC, give or take, pictograms and tokens morphed into protocuniform. And this is how writing evolved. I mean, this is fascinating stuff. It's much more fascinating to, than to say it came out of nowhere. It actually didn't come out of nowhere. Um, it was a series of converging events um, that led to the first system of writing, which is fascinating uh, utterly on its own face. So I'm going to give you an example of where uh, pictograms um, evolved with the representation of the um, the the shapes, uh, the what were they called? Um, tokens, the tokens. Sorry, you know that's I, I, I use that same website you got that stuff from. Uh, yeah, for my web uh, for my first article on my website. I know. Nice. Exactly, I remember. Ex I know exactly what you're talking about and where you got that from too. Right, so let me let me show you where uh, or show our audience, since you already know, uh, where the pictograms met the tokens in the form of being engraved on clay. So here we can see the engravings that represent the tokens, and here we can see the pictograms. Um, this is a pictogram tablet featuring an account of and. The thing about this is how this generated was from commerce, which is the most interesting part of it. Uh, uh, this represents 33 meshes of oil um, from Godin Tepe in Iran. Uh, and here we have another representation of a tablet showing uh, pictograms. Uh, and I'm going to scroll down real quick so everyone can see. Uh, this is the sort of the evolution of pictogram to um cuneiform so we have a head then it was tipped on the side and then it became lines and then it became this and this is the evolution here and this is well researched there's there's no ambiguity about this uh it did not come out of nowhere it took hundreds of years maybe even thousands when you consider the token uh origin of these which was 8000 bce uh and the the uh, tokens uh, aligned with the pictographs and then eventually became uh, a writing system. So, you know, cuneiform writing evolved over, over at least hundreds of years, uh, perhaps thousands of years. So it did not come out of nowhere by any stretch of the imagination. All right. That's what I got for that segment. So yeah, I was I, so I wrote down what you said. So pictographic scarce. So like I said, I, that's the same website that I found that I used to understand the writing system for the Sumerians. And like I said, I have this book right here, right? The ancient literature of Sumer. And I want to yeah. show you something that I'm going to bring up. So this is the electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature. What we do know is the Sumerians weren't the first people to inhabit that land. It was the Ubadians. The Ubadians actually inhabited that land. And, okay. what I've, and what I've learned from my research is that's where you get most of the reptilian stuff from. But we'll get into that later. All right. Um, that, that the, you, they don't have a time frame exactly for Ubadians, but it was definitely before the Sumerians. Right. And mm -hmm. um, I took a class from Bar Ilan University. And Dr. Nili Summit uh, from the class, she said that the Sumer the Mesopotamia, because she doesn't say Sumerian or Akkadian, she says the Mesopotamian writing system started around that makes 30, sense. 3200 BC. Yeah, I, I mean, by 3200 3, BCE, it's when it became a full-fledged written language. Uh, but it, it arrived at like, from if you can imagine like three rivers flowing into a major river and that's how the language first started there was uh, the pictographic there was the token and then there was the syllabic and then they all intertwined and at one point that then it became a full-fledged language around right. 3200 3100 bce it's it's a little bit muddled or disputed exactly but that's the approximate timeline Right. And that and that's what that's about what I've learned, too. And the reason why I brought that up is because you can see a pictographic script from around the world. 
Um, all that means is just basically, I mean, hieroglyphics are considered pictographics. Right? Absolutely. Right. You know, but what's interesting is when I look at the electronic text corpus of similar literature, they give you one set of dates. They say third and early second millennium BCE, right? And this book is the same thing, right? This book is the same yeah. thing as the website, like completely the same, I guess, is the updated version. And they give a date around being 18th. Uh, let me make, let me make sure I quote it correctly. It says t- clay tab is dating to the 18th century BCE. So that, that just lets me know that, you know, that wasn't, that's more around the Babylonian time frame. But right. I want to um, give you something that I, that I found out. So my mom bought me a 1873 uh, Holy Bible. I have it right up here in front of me. And when I'm reading through it, when I read through it, and I posted it on my YouTube. I learned that Babylon, Chaldea, and Shinar slash Sumer is all in the one in the same. Mm-hmm. It's actually all called Chaldea. Okay. So that kind of gives you uh, an idea of how now, now instead of following the Sumerians and saying like the Sumerians, it just came out of nowhere. That's not necessarily true. Well, there's a lot of conflation that occurs. So what you just said makes total sense to me. Yeah, Babylon was actually the capital, according to my 1873 Bible. And I'll send you a picture of it in a, in a little while. Um, like I said, I have it on my YouTube channel. Is the capital of Chaldea. So that that's what makes me so makes me know more about the idea of it not just happening out of nowhere. And then, for instance, like you said, uh, the Syrian, the Sumerians get a lot of stuff from the Sumerians, or at least your research showed that, right? I, I also learned that everybody takes what the Sumerian or what the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Hittites and so on and so forth. And they say that the Sumerians said it, but the Sumerian civilization only lasted, but so long once the Akkadians took over, it was, it was pretty much just a free for all from there. Interesting. Yeah. And I think when we get into the next uh, portion, uh, we're going to learn that cuneiform was not cuneiform was not, um, something that only the Sumerians did. It cuneiform was uh, something that was used by multiple cultures um, out of Mesopotamia. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot more complex and interesting um, than to try to uh, boil everything down to a single culture or a, a single source, you know? Um, so let me get up the, the next, uh, video. What are the first decipherings? Like mm-hmm. what year was the first deciphering? It was in 1800. I don't have to, I think around 1850, uh, George Smith, uh, he actually worked, uh, at, uh, at, at the, uh, I believe it was Cambridge. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just heard some say that George Smith was the first person to decipher cuneiform. Okay. Um, well, there have been many predecessors before him. Um, there was Friedrich Munter, a German scholar who discovered the word king in the late 1700s. Uh, he published this work um, after Carson Niebuhr, a German cartographer, copied uh, ruins from Persepolis. So uh, I can show a screen here. Let me share the screen a little bit. Um, you know, the history of this is fascinating. Uh, it took a lot of people and a lot of effort to decipher uh, cuneiform writing, and it was a step-by-step process. Uh, it did not just happen where George Smith just figured this out by himself. In fact, it was already deciphered before George Smith ever even looked at cuneiform writing. Uh, so let's see here. Let me see this. What's going on? Yep, I see it. All right. So right here, uh, Friedrich Munter, a a German scholar, uh, discovered the word king uh, in cuneiform writing um, after this individual, Carson Niebuhr, a German cartographer, copied them from the ruins at Perserbalis in 1778. Like, this shit is incredible. Like, it goes way fucking back. Um, uh, next was George Grodenfeld in 1802, a German 
epigraphist. Um, he extended this work by realizing the king's name is often followed by a great king of kings and the name of the king's father. All right. So this was some of his decipherings right here. He published his work in 1815. Um, incredible. I mean, this is just amazing stuff. Um, he was followed in 1822 by Antoine Jean Saint Martin, a French Orientalist, who was able to confirm that the corresponding words in the cuneiform script Xerxes, Zazara, and Xerxes, the great king, which he published in 1823. Uh, then along came Rasmus Christian Rask, a Danish linguist, who was able to identify the letter M which allowed for the decipherment of the supreme god Arumazda and Archimedes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I remember that one, yeah. <laughs> Next came Eugene Burnoff, a French scholar in 1836. After viewing the inscriptions published by Nibir, he discovered they contained a list of satrapies of Darius. These are governors of the king. From that, he was able to identify 30 letters. Um, in the early 1800s, from 1833 to 1835, Christian Lassen, a German oriental orientologist, contributed signif significantly to the grammatical understanding of old Persian language and the use of vowels. In the final step of decipherment, the trilingual biastun which is an inscription, a multilingual acromanian royal inscription on a large rock relief on the cliff of Mount Behistin in the Kermashasa province of Iran in 5000 BCE. This was completed by Henry Wallens, a British officer and mm -hmm. orientalist who published four books in the 1850s and Edward Hinks, an Irish clergyman and a Syrianologist. Edward Hinks discovered that Old Persian is partly syllabary, and he was put to a blind test with several other contemporaries at the time. Henry Rawlingson, a British officer, and Julius Upper, a French Syrianologist. The group was referred to as the Holy Trinity of Cuneiform. They were each given a copy of a previously undeciphered script to see if they would all translate it in the same manner, and they did. So this is not to say that George Smith didn't translate anything. He most certainly did and is well published. He's first credited for deciphering of many of the ancient Sumerian epics, specifically the Epic of Gilgamesh, but he's not nowhere near the first to decipher cuneiform. Yeah. I, I mean, I I've, I've knew that there were other people that came. I didn't have a list like you did, but I definitely knew that there were people who came before George Smith. And I don't think, I don't think George Smith worked or um, George Smith. Um, or Cambridge. Yeah. I don't think he worked at Cambridge. I think it was. I, think <laughs> I didn't was, even look at that because I was so focused on like the facts regarding the. Uh, all right, so I'm going to give you the source for. I got to check. And then you out. can go ahead because I know you had it ready, but let me just give you the source for which I was just talking about. Um, it's a book from the early 19th century, the archaeology of the cuneiform inscriptions. Um, it highlights everything I was just talking about. So, you know, this is why it's important to do real research, you know, and not just speculate with your own opinions. All right, here we go. I'll let you go ahead and show what you have to show. Yeah, I was just uh, this guy right here. here. Here's that guy that found the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, tablets. 